When I read Peter Baker's story in the New York Times about the Kennedy assassination, by the way, it of course is on the website today and in the newsletter, I immediately thought of Gerald Posner and hoped that we would be able to get him on today's program, and we've been successful. Let me say this at the outset. Gerald Posner has been a guest of mine on many occasions over the years, and I note that in 2013, he was here on the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy to discuss his 1993 book called Case Closed, Lee Harvey Oswald and the Assassination of JFK. It's available as a book club podcast release as of today. I'm embarrassed that we never put it out previously, but we're putting it out today. So if you want to know more about Gerald and his perspective on the Kennedy assassination, know that that is out there. The story from Peter Baker begins as follows. Now, 60 years later, I'm picking it up midstream. Paul Landis. One of the Secret Service agents just feet away from President John F. Kennedy on that fateful day in Dallas is telling his story in full for the first time. And in at least one key aspect, his account differs from the official version in a way that may change the understanding of what happened in Dealey Plaza. Who is Paul Landis and what is this all about? I turn to Gerald Posner. He's the author of 13 acclaimed books including New York Times nonfiction bestsellers, Why America Slept, God's Bankers, and the aforementioned Case Closed. Uh, Gerald, thank you so much for being here. Who is Paul Landis? Uh, Michael, thanks for having me. Uh, Paul Landis is a Secret Service agent uh, who was on the car directly behind the presidential limousine. Um, he was assigned to protect Mrs. Kennedy. And as a matter of fact, Michael, uh, in the pictures that we have of the Kennedys, Jacqueline and JFK, when they arrive at Dallas that morning, they fly in from Fort Worth. Uh, she has a bouquet of roses. And she has the pink suit on. You'll see two Secret Service agents near them scanning the crowd. It's Clint Hill, who later becomes famous for jumping on the back of the limousine as the assassination plays out. And it's Paul Landis. Um, the I think a footnote that a lot of people may not know um, is that both of them were at a club the night before called The Cellar. This has been reported nine years ago. Uh, that was a 24-hour sort of coffee house and bar, San Francisco style in Dallas. Uh, Cliff, uh, Clint Hill said he left around 2 a.m., got up at 6 a.m. the next morning. Um, and in his own statement, as a matter of fact, Paul Landis said he left at 5 a.m. No drinking. They both said they didn't drink. Uh, blue sky laws. Uh, so they were sober. But uh, Landis probably had an hour, an hour and a half of sleep uh, when uh, it was the uh, next day. So not the greatest thing for a Secret Service uh, contingent. They all got a little disciplined after that. So did this new account catch you cold in other words, to what extent had Paul Landis been on the record? And if so, had he said things consistent or inconsistent with what he is saying now? It caught me completely by surprise. I learned about it only the night before, uh, two nights before Peter Baker had run his column. And then Peter Baker had reached out to me for a comment. Um, somebody had sent me some copies, proofs of uh, what Landis was saying. And then I reached out to people who knew him. Uh, he had said nothing like this in the past. Uh, that's why it was such a surprise. He hasn't even given that many interviews. I mean, he made two statements immediately after the assassination, one four days after a two-page statement, and one a week after a seven-page detailed statement in which he describes what he thinks are the sequence of shots, uh, talks about everything, nothing remotely related to seeing a bullet, a whole bullet in the limo, picking it up, putting it in his uh, jacket pocket, and then walking around for a while at the hospital before deciding to put it on a stretcher there at Parkland Hospital and then leaving and telling no one about it. Um, I'm doing something odd that you would probably do, which is I am not reaching a conclusion until I've examined all the facts. I'm talking to people who knew him, uh, and the uh, you know a lot of people are jumping to an immediate conclusion of this is the end of the single bullet or this is uh, you know complete lie. I think it's more complicated than that because Landis did tell a couple of colleagues eight to nine years ago the story about picking up a bullet it was a little bit more streamlined than the version Peter Baker tells and what he tells in his book. He then put it on an empty gurney when he was leaving Parkland after JFK was declared dead. That recollection 
became a much grander story about putting it on JFK's gurney, um, which is the version we now have in the book. So from Peter Baker's piece, there is this. What it comes down to is a copper jacketed 6.5 millimeter projectile. The Warren Commission decided that one of the bullets fired that day struck the president from behind, exited from the front of his throat, and continued to hit Mr. Connolly, somehow managing to injure his back, chest, wrist, and thigh. It seemed incredible that a single bullet could do all that, so skeptics called it the magic bullet theory. I'll just say parenthetically, the late, great Arlen Specter, my friend and mentor, when I would say to him the single bullet theory, he would say to me, uh, Ma- Michael, it's the single bullet conclusion because we've proven it. Not everybody agreed. Back to the Baker story. Investigators came to that conclusion partly because the bullet was found on a stretcher believed to have held Mr. Connolly at Parkland Memorial Hospital, so they assumed it had exited his body during efforts to save his life. But Mr. Landis, who was never interviewed by the Warren Commission, said that is not what happened. In fact, he said he was the one who found the bullet and he found it not in the hospital near Mr. Connolly, but in the presidential limousine lodged in the back of the seat behind where Kennedy was sitting. When he spotted the bullet after the motorcade arrived at the hospital, he said he grabbed it to thwart souvenir hunters. Then for reasons that still seem fuzzy even to him, he said he entered the hospital and placed it next to Kennedy on the president's stretcher, assuming it could somehow help doctors figure out what happened. At some point, he now guesses the stretchers must have been pushed together and the bullet was shaken from one to another your thoughts gerald posner you know uh, so michael uh, memory is fungible we you know we talk to other people we see documentaries we read books um and these flashbulb memories as uh, memory experts call them traumatic events like 9 11 the kennedy assassination the challenger explosion we all know where we are and then over the years new memories fit into our recall and we could pass a lie detector test about how we believe them so i think he's sincere in what he's recalling the question is whether he's right and the problem for him on some of it is that when he says that he put it on jfk's stretcher the facts contradict that the doctors who were treating kennedy at parkland the medical staff who were there they never took jack kennedy off of the stretcher he was rolled in on they never put him onto a different table which landis remembers that landis was never inside trauma room one where jfk was treated and that's from the that's from the secret service agent who was guarding the door and all of the doctors who were there so he now says he was shoved in but nobody else remembers him there i think michael that assuming he did find the bullet picked it up in the limousine, put it in his pocket, that all these years later, maybe he is saying that he put it on the president's stretcher near his foot as a tribute to the president because that's where it belonged. It somehow doesn't seem as bad as just putting it on an empty gurney. And by the way, when the Warren Commission said the bullet fell from Connolly's gurney, I'll tell you what we do know. The chief engineer of the hospital bumped into a gurney in the hallway near the emergency room in the elevators after the president's body had already been taken back to Washington and a bullet rolled off. That did turn to be the single bullet that inflicted the wounds on both Kennedy and Connie. We know that ballistics matches it to Oswald's rifle. They've done the test to make sure through neutron activation that it matches the fragments from Kennedy's headshot in the car. Here's the thing. The chief engineer never knew which of two gurneys he bumped into. One was Connolly's. It had been brought down there after surgery. The other belonged to a young boy who had been brought into Parkland around the same time. It had sheets and towels on it. Um, and Landis says he put it on with, with a sheet so that it wouldn't roll off. It is possible that he put it onto that gurney, and that's where the bullet came out of. The Warren Commission couldn't imagine how it couldn't be Conley's because why would a gurney unconnected to the assassination have the bullet? Well, now we may have the answer. Secret Service agent might have taken the bullet, put it in his pocket and made the tremendous judgment in error of instead of turning it into his superiors as a critical piece of evidence, he instead just happened to deposit it on a gurney and walked out. What we know for sure, Gerald, is that there was a bullet that was discovered that had fallen from a gurney. Like, that would be the very most simplistic, factual assertion that everybody ought to be able to agree on. Right. 
Okay, and Connolly, right. both Connolly and Kennedy came to the same hospital, Parkland, for care immediately after the shooting. Obviously, Kennedy expired. Connolly, uh, thankfully, did not. So the Warren, just if I can break this down, the Warren Commission understanding of where the magic bullet had come from was from which of the two gurneys? From Connolly's gurney. And the reason that they assume that is Connolly was put on a gurney, rushed into the hospital, then they took him up to the surgical floor, second floor, and then they moved Connolly onto the operating table. When they did that, they brought his, his gurney back to the main floor near the elevator and left it there. So it was unattended. Kennedy's gurney, he stayed on that. The doctor said in their testimony, in their witness statements, and to me in 1992, they didn't want to waste a second in treating the president. They knew how gravely wounded he was. They could see that when he was brought in. So they want, didn't want to waste a second in trying to revive him. He did not get moved off of that gurney. And when they he expired, when he died, and they made that decision, the doctors sort of walked out of that room. They left Mrs. Kennedy there for half a second to, to have a moment with him. And then the nurses moved Jack's body finally off of that gurney. They wrapped him in new sheets because it was so bloody. They took the sheets, the towels that were on JFK's gurney, and they put them into the laundry hamper to clean them. And that gurney never got near Connie's and was not put back out in the hallway. It sounds to me like you're saying that there's no time that he could have entered the hospital placed the bullet on Kennedy's gurney while Kennedy was on that gurney because it was used for his treatment. Even if he had been in trauma room one, the idea... And no one saw him there. Right, leaned over, and the doctors and the nurses and Mrs. Kennedy (laughs) and the Secret Service agent, William Greer, who was there guarding the door, missed the fact that he seemed to be uh, putting something next to Kennedy's foot. In his account, Paul Landis says, by the way, the bullet almost rolled off. So I, I folded a piece of the, the blanket so that that wouldn't happen. So, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But I don't close the door on the fact that this agent may have found a bullet in the car. That was the one that came out of Connolly's thigh. It wasn't in very deep. We know the bullet was only moving at about 400 feet a second by that point, just enough to puncture the skin, but not very deep. As a matter of fact, the doctor who operated on Conley, Michael, at, at Parkland Hospital, said, I know that bullet's somewhere around here because he saw the thigh wound. He said it just was a superficial wound. Let's look for it. He had people look for the bullet, but he didn't think of checking the gurney. They didn't find it at that time. So let's say it pops out in the car. The agent grabs it, makes a tremendous error in judgment by thinking this is important evidence, but I'll figure out what to do with it later. Puts it in his pocket. Then the president dies, the person he's supposed to protect. They're getting ready to leave the hospital. They have a fight, as a matter of fact, with the local police and sheriff in Dallas who want to keep the body to do an autopsy there. Some of the Secret Service agents actually drew their guns. It's a very tense moment. He has to decide what he's going to do. Does he turn the bullet in? Does he get rid of it? He puts it on a gurney. I believe it's either Conley's gurney or the one from the young boy. That's the bullet that is what we call Commission Exhibit 399, the single bullet, the so-called magic bullet. He has provided the answer as to how it got on the gurney, but he's given too much what I call sort of a grander story around it, of placing it on Kennedy's gurney, which can factually been disproven by all the other witnesses. So I think there's a kernel of truth here. I'm not dismissing it, but I don't take all the embellishments to heart. Gerald, are all bullets that were discharged from Lee Harvey Oswald's weapon accounted for? Were, are there any missing bullets? No, as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, that's the uh, the part that it makes it to me so conclusive. <clears throat> there are you know fragments inside the car of the terrible head wound that the president had. Those fragments were matched ballistically to you know Oswald's gun as they were from the same lot of bullets. The whole bullet, the single bullet, was matched ballistically to Oswald's gun. And then a neutron activation test done in the late 70s said that those fragments all came from the same batch of ammunition. What I think conspiracy theorists will do, though, Michael, is they will say, ah, the bullet that Landis is describing must be another bullet. It was never found. It's the mystery missing bullet. That bullet was probably from some other person that tried to shoot at the president. Landis, by the way, his speculation was that that bullet that he found was the one that hit the president in the high neck rear shoulder. 
and then somehow had a reduced gunpowder charge. So it dropped out onto the back seat. Now, that's one of the craziest ideas I've ever heard, that some assassin is going to take gunpowder out of a bullet because he only wants to have it barely pierce his target as opposed to killing him, and that that was the back wound on Kennedy. It just makes no sense. How is it that Landis was never interviewed by the Warren Commission? The, uh, as a matter of fact, only five of the agents, um, the 28 agents assigned that day to the entire operation, 12 of them in the actual detail riding along on the cars, only five interviewed by the Warren Commission for live testimony. They all gave statements. Landis gave, you know, nine pages of typewritten one, one spaced, uh, you know, statements. And then the Warren Commission counsel would look at those, decide which ones they thought might give the best overall perspective. And by best, I don't mean one that fits a theory, but give the, the fullest idea of what happened that day. And Landis's statement is pretty unremarkable. He hears only two shots, by the way. Um, he's one of the very few witnesses who heard only two. Ear witnesses varied that day. A lot heard three, some heard four, some heard five. There's an echo chamber inside Dealey Plaza, but very few heard two. Uh, he sees a black man. Uh, he says he sees a, a young African-American man running over near the grassy knoll, crouched down, and he tries to point to him. Uh, he leaves that out of the current book completely. But his statement isn't that interesting. There's nothing in it that you say, oh, we've got to have this guy testify. Wow. What does Clint Hill say about Landis's new account? So I listened to Clint Hill on a uh, interview yesterday on NBC News and uh, Clint Hill, the, you know, the agent who sprawled across at risk of life and limb to himself, the only agent who really reacted that day and, and did something to try to stop the, sh the shooting. He said that there are inconsistencies and problems. Uh, there are contradictions to what was said uh, about uh, that bullet ending up on, on the JFK uh, gurney. And I thought that was very important because Clint Hill did not say, I think this is a lie. Clint Hill did not say, this is just a story concocted by somebody who's looking to sell some books. He didn't say, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. And I'm wondering if some of the agents have, ha have had the belief for a while that the bullet that we talk about as the single bullet, instead of popping out onto the gurney from Connolly's thigh, had actually come loose in the car was found and what none of us none of us could have imagined michael is that a secret service agent would take a piece of evidence that critical <laughs> and then instead of turning it in just leave it there he says at one point landis by the way in his account that he thought to himself maybe this will be useful for the autopsy by the way he knew at that point the autopsy was not going to be in Texas. That's what the Secret Service agents had drawn their guns for, to make sure that the president's body went back to Washington for the autopsy. So he knew that wasn't going to happen. So there's not a good explanation as to why he left it there. It's one of the, I guess, uh, worst moments in Secret Service history, And if you think of a case. Your grasp at your fingertips of the facts of this case and the recollection and the number and what floor it was on and how many gurney is testament to the fact that i think you've written the definitive book in case closed by the way the essay that you've just written about this new revelation also posted at my website and in my newsletter and as i underscore the anniversary uh interview that i did with you on the 50th anniversary we're releasing today because i think people are going to want more and i encourage them to read case closed and to listen to our interview gerald thank you so much that was everything that i hoped you'd be able to deliver no, Michael, thank you for covering it in detail. I appreciate it. It's, it's tremendous. It's an important story. Yep. And now we have to find out what parts of it are true. My God, thank it never you. ends. It just never ends. Yeah. Gerald sure. Posner, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Gerald. I really appreciate it.